Bobby Dunbar was a four-year-old boy from Louisiana who disappeared on a fishing trip while with his wealthy family in 1912. After months of searching, detectives believed they had found the boy and returned him to his parents. Years later, with the development of DNA technology, the descendants of Bobby Dunbar were in for quite the shock. Bobby Dunbar was the son of Leslie and Percy Dunbar in Opalis, Louisiana. Bobby vanished on August 23, 1912, while on a trip with his family to Swazi Lake in St. Landry Parish. Searchers trudged through the waters, looking for any signs of the boy. They even cut open the stomachs of alligators and blew the lake up with dynamite, thinking that would dislodge the boy's body from the lake. Searchers did find footprints that led to a railroad track that paired with rumors of a strange person being seen in the area, led the Dunbars to believe that Bobby had been kidnapped. After eight months of searching, investigators found a boy that fit Bobby's appearance, who was in the custody of a man named William Cantwell Walters, a handyman traveling through Mississippi. Walters stated that the boy's name was Charles Bruce Anderson and that he had been allowed custody of the boy by Julia Anderson, the boy's mother who worked for his family. Police did not believe his story and he was arrested. The Dunbars were called to Mississippi to identify the boy. During the trial, there were witnesses who testified to seeing Walters with the boy before Bobby went missing, but the court still found Walters guilty and the boy was returned to the Dunbars where he lived the rest of his life as Bobby. He eventually married and had four kids of his own and passed away in 1966. In 2004, a reporter from the Associated Press questioned the Dunbar family, and Bob Dunbar Jr. agreed to take a DNA test to put an end to the mystery. They compared his DNA with that of his cousin, the son of Alonzo Dunbar, the younger brother of Bobby Dunbar Sr. The tests show that he was not related to the Dunbar family. What happened to the real Bobby Dunbar, lost at Swazi Lake, is still a mystery. On June 21, 1977, six-month-old Mark's Panama Moriarty Barnes disappears with his mother, Charlotte Moriarty, from Haula, Hawaii. They are reported missing three weeks later. Marx's father, who is not married to his mother, launches an all-out search but finds nothing. Two days after Marx disappears, the police on the other side of Oahu is summoned when a woman named Jana May and her baby is found in a house belonging to someone else. Jana is sent to a psychiatric hospital but later vanishes, leaving her infant son to become a ward of the state. Jana claims her son, named Tandanda May, is half native Hawaiian. The state put him in an orphanage. When Tandanda is four years old, he is adopted by Stephen Pat Carter. The couple takes Tandanda across the country and raises him in New Jersey near Philadelphia. They give him a new name, Steve Carter. In January 2011, Steve sees a news report about a Connecticut woman who discovered she had been abducted as an infant and later adopted. Curious about his own past as an adopted child, Steve begins looking around a website for missing children. Carter stumbles upon a missing person ad for Mark Barnes. He was intrigued that the boy in the picture looks just like him. A DNA test would later confirm that Steve Carter is Mark Barnes. Carter, who was raised an only child, finds out he has three sisters and a biological father who never stopped looking for him. For the last 35 years, Steve Carter has lived a settled life. He's married and works in the medical software industry in Philadelphia. Angeline McGowie was adopted by a family in Sinurba Lee when she was only three days old. Her original family resides in Banyuangi, East Java and had to give her up due to financial reasons, and they trusted the adopted family to give her a better life. On May 16th of 2015, eight-year-old Angeline was reported missing while she was playing in her house in Bali. Her stepsisters, Christine and Yvonne, made an account, Help Find Angeline, Bali's Missing Child, on Facebook to help begin searching for their little stepsister. Angeline lived with her adopted mother, Marguerite Megui. Her adopted father, Douglas, is said to be very fond of her, but then Douglas died. According to the teachers and students in her elementary school, Angeline was a very quiet kid. One of her classmates even said that she changed when her adopted father died. 
She often came to school in an inappropriate condition. She smelled really bad and her friends didn't want to play with her. The teacher even had to bathe her in school so she wouldn't get bullied. She often came late to class and said she had to feed 50 chickens in her home before leaving for school. When the news about her being missing was spread nationally in Indonesia, her adopted mother, Marguerite, even invited some TV shows and expressed her sadness. She gained a lot of sympathy from the public and some psychics even tried to help her find Angeline. Two of the national ministers even visited Marguerite's house, but she didn't approve them to come inside her house. This raised suspicion among police and crime investigators. After a long search, Angeline was finally found in the 10th of June buried in the ground of Marguerite's backyard near the chicken coop. She was found wrapped in a bed cover along with her doll. In the autopsy, police found signs of violence, namely bruises on the face, neck, hands, and legs. Also a burn wound, possibly from a lit cigarette on her right back. The team also discovered traces of plastic rope in four places on the body. There is speculation regarding the motive for killing Angeline. It is believed that Angeline's adopted father left her 60% of his wealth when he died. Marguerite and her daughters were very jealous of this. Based on a forensic evidence gathered by police, Marguerite beat Angeline to death in her room, told her gardener named Agus Tay Hamdani to light a cigarette and put it on Angeline's back to check if she was still alive. After that, Marguerite told Agus to bury her in the backyard. After the discovery of Angeline's body, Marguerite allegedly promised Agus a large amount of money if he makes a fake confession to claim himself as the killer. In 1957, Lawrence Bader, an amateur archer and Akron-based cookware salesman, ignored severe storm warnings and took a boat out on Lake Erie. When his boat was discovered the next day, damaged, missing an oar, and without Bader in it. Rescuers searched the lake but never found him. Bader left behind three children and a pregnant wife who received $40,000 in life insurance. Eight years later, a family friend was in Chicago when he encountered a man who looked eerily like Lawrence Bader. The doppelgator was John Fritz Johnson, a well-known radio and television personality in Omaha, Nebraska. Some of his notable endeavors included announcing archery matches and winning 13 archery titles, which was a favorite hobby of Bader's. Fritz Johnson insisted that he was not Bader. He claimed he was raised in an orphanage and served 14 years in the Navy before moving to Omaha, where he had a wife and two children, but he agreed to take a fingerprint test to put everyone's mind at ease. To his own apparent astonishment, Johnson's fingerprints were a perfect match for Bader's. Johnson's life fell apart almost immediately. His wife annulled their marriage and lost his television job. Bader's reappearance also caused problems for his first wife. His newfound aliveness meant the insurance company wanted their money back. Johnson maintained that he had no memory of his former life as Bader. Natasha Ryan was 14 years old when she went missing in her hometown of Rockhampton, Australia in 1998. Leonard Fraser, known as the Rockhampton Rapist, confessed to the murder of four girls, including Natasha. Her body was never found, but his confession was believed, so her family had a funeral for her, and the Rockhampton Rapist went to trial for her murder in 2003. Nearly five years after she vanished and was presumably murdered, police received an anonymous tip and they raided her boyfriend's house 2.5 miles away from where Natasha lived. Natasha was there, living inside a wardrobe. She had been secretly living there the whole time. Natasha told police she didn't leave because the lie had become too big. 